This segment of King World News is sponsored by Esperanza Resources, an emerging gold and silver producer with two advanced stage projects and a $27 million cash position after selling a property to Silver Standard. And Esperanza Resources is one of the companies that Rick Rule said will be taken over in the coming consolidation phase in the mining sector. Esperanza Resources, symbol EPZ in Canada and ESPZF in the U.S. This is King World News. I'm Eric King, and you're about to hear from acclaimed money manager Stephen Lieb. Remember to go to our homepage at kingworldnews.com for more interviews. Well, this week we have one of the great company builders in the gold mining world, Rob McEwen, former CEO of Gold Corp. Top trends forecaster Gerald Salente gives King World News listeners globally an exclusive sneak peek at his upcoming summer trends journal. And we're earlier in the week we had the extraordinary John Embry from Sprott Asset Management, as well as Michael Pinto, senior economist at Euro Pacific Capital. And with gold and silver so volatile, don't miss the KWN Weekly Metals Wrap. Joining us now is the founder of the Lieb Group and president of Lieb Capital Management and editor of The Complete Investor, Stephen Lieb. Stephen, right away, you have this book coming out, Red Alert. It's all about resource scarcity. Can you discuss that for the listeners globally? Yeah, Eric, I think the United States has been asleep at the switch for a long time. And I think that the Chinese, in contrast, have been wide awake to an emerging problem in the world. And it's one called resource scarcity. We've heard a lot about resource scarcity. And, you know, mostly the reaction in the U.S. is to just shrug their shoulders. We'll figure out a way around it. Well, there really is not a way around certain kinds of scarcity. For instance, rare earths are things that have been all over the press. What people seem to fail to realize is that most of the rare earths we can produce outside of China don't do us any good in the kinds of applications we're going to need rare earths for, namely high-temperature magnets, magnets that run in high-temperature environments, that is. For that, you need these heavy rare earths, and they're not found in the U.S., not found in Mali Kor. They're not found in Australia, by and large. They're found in China, probably well over 95% of them. That really puts a limitation on even our ability to develop renewable energies because you cannot really build a wind turbine without rare earths. Another critical metal, silver, which the Chinese have been accumulating, is vital, vital for building out anything resembling solar energy. You really cannot produce solar without silver. There are some, you know, offshoots, these thin film solar technologies, but they use metals that are even or materials that are even rarer than silver. So silver becomes a very critical metal. What are we doing with silver? I mean, you know, we raise margin requirements on the commodity exchanges and we think we've solved the silver requirement. Copper, If you look at a recent BHP report, they'll tell you that copper is an even scarcer material than is oil. There's not that much copper left in the world. Or if there is more copper left in the world, it's going to be very, very difficult to get because its grade is very low. And that means it's going to take a lot of resources to get the copper that's available. And where do you get these resources from? Well, you get them, you know, from countries that still have oil, countries that have silver, countries that have copper itself, etc., I mean, there are these circles here surrounding uh, and interconnecting all these different resources. And we don't realize that a scarcity of oil implies a scarcity of even resources that are, you know, on the surface, no pun intended, very plentiful, like iron ore. Iron ore is one of the most plentiful materials in the world, yet if you look at its price over the past 10 or 15 years, it's far exceeded the price of oil. And the reason is it takes tremendous amounts of other materials that are scarce to get iron ore from place A to place B and to mine iron ore. We are stuck in a world of resource scarcity. Unless we figure out a way around this, we won't even be able to build out renewable resources like wind. We cannot make a wind turbine without high temperature rare earths. And if we're not careful, sooner or later, the Chinese will control most of the silver And without that, how do we make solar energy? Let's talk about that for just a minute, Stephen, because I've always said for many years that silver right behind oil is a strategic resource, essentially. Totally. I mean, you have to have this component. And as you mentioned, even for the military applications and otherwise conductivity of electricity, it's called the silver standard for a reason. What about silver and the scarcity there? Now we have all the people that are worried about the money printing. They're buying it up and hoarding it. I think it's desperate. I mean, literally, I'm using that word, you know, in a well-measured way. 
I think when you look at Japan right now, in the wake of that horrible nuclear accident, Japan is on record as saying that they're going two ways with their energy situation. They're going to try and conserve. There are limits to that, and they've already come up against some of the limits in some of their trial conservation projects. So that leaves renewables. Well, which renewables? Well, you know that they're very limited in terms of wind. Why? Because of the rare earth situation. They can't get those high-temperature rare earths from China. That leaves solar. And in order to really build out solar in any meaningful way, you need silver. And silver becomes a very, very critical metal. Yes, it is. It's silver is an extremely special metal, as you said, Eric. It's the most conductive metal of any in the world, including copper. It's the best conductivity in terms of both thermal, conducting heat, and also electricity. And it's also one of the most reflective metals in the world. You need it in across the board, in military applications, in electronic applications, and especially in my view of the world, building out renewable energy. Ditto for copper. You're not going to make these super smart grids without a lot of copper. You're not going to urbanize cities in China or Indonesia or any place else or India without a lot of copper. And as I said before, grades of copper are decreasing, and it's becoming very, very much more resource-intensive to uh, discover and build out copper, find and recover uh, those copper deposits that are still there. Stephen, let me ask you, I'm going to go right back to silver, and then I want to ask you some questions about where this resource scarcity is leading us. But silver, when you look at the fact that it is being hoarded globally because of all the money printing, so people are buying it for the investment purposes and the wealth guarding preservation, and then you look at the amount of that's used in industrial demand, as you said, this is a long-term problem. And what does this mean for people that have been buying silver in the $5 area, $10, 15 20 30 $35 area? Where is silver headed longer term? What kind of a mania will that end up in, Stephen? Well, I mean, the only thing, in my opinion, that's going to stop silver from going up, you know, I could just look at it from a monetary point of view. Forget about all the industrial applications. The ratio of silver to gold in the world is about, I don't know, 10 to 1, 7 and a half to 1, you know, above and below ground. Look at reserves. So as a monetary metal, you could make a case that silver should be no more than 10 to 1 ratio with gold. Gold's a little easier to hold because it's more valuable, so you don't have to have as much of it to hold the same amount of value. That's a definite plus, but still, silver at $100, just based on monetary factors, is not a weird or wide-eyed projection. You mentioned the 10 to 1 just now. With gold at 1500 that puts silver at $150. It does. I don't think people realize that's not outrageous, Stephen. No, it isn't. It's not at all outrageous. Silver at $150 is in no way outrageous. I'm not counting the critical, the critical applications in the industrial and renewable areas, renewable energy areas. Resource scarcity situation, is this going to lead us to war in places like Africa where we're competing with the Chinese and they're buying up assets? I hope not, but I sure think that we've got to confront the Chinese sooner or later and we've got to say to them, hey, look, we know what you're doing. There's only so many resources in this world. We see it in copper. Look, BHP in their most recent earnings report missed their production target on virtually every metal they produce, every metal and every material, including oil, that they produce. They miss production targets. Why? Because it's getting harder and harder to produce things across the board. And I pick BHP because it's the largest. But what you say about BHP, you could say about Rio Tinto. We are missing production targets across the board in virtually every country because it's becoming harder and harder to produce this stuff as grades get lower and you need more and more other resources in order to do it. It's that simple. It's right in front of you. Anybody in Congress, anywhere can pick up a report on BHP and see, missing across the board. That's not because they have bad management. I think Cloppers is one of the brightest guys in the whole commodity space. But when you miss in one or two things because of extraneous factors, okay. But when you miss across the board, that's a message. That's a shot across the bow, if not a direct hit. Stephen, I can tell this has been stressing you out. You did this book. You see a crisis here. you losing any sleep over this. How worrisome is this? I do lose sleep over it. I'm not just saying that. I mean, I've got two kids. They're in their 20s. And, you know, I worry about what kind of future we're leaving for them. Yeah, I do. I honestly, you know, when I go to bed at night, I'm worried about these kids. Worried I have one grandchild. And, yeah, I worry about them. I honestly do. Let me ask you before we close here, Stephen, about gold. The listeners are going to want to hear your opinion on that. We've had the move up to 1500 It's still acted very strong up here. Where are we heading on the gold market? Much, much higher. I mean, look, we have been on a treadmill 
it's completely opposite to what Jim channels thinks. But we have, in this country, been on a treadmill to hell for at least the last decade. We continue to print money, 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 money to sort of offset the effects of higher commodity prices. Oil is a major tax in this country. And to a greater extent, so are other very high commodity prices. And the only way to try and offset that is to print more and more money. Ditto for Europe, ditto for any developed country that does not have a big resource base, such as us. It's a treadmill to hell. It literally is, because the only way we can compensate for declining standards of living as a result of these higher commodity prices is to try and print more and more money, and sooner or later you're going to have a lot of inflation. The gold market is right now anticipating that sooner or later. But, I mean, I have no target for gold, Eric. I guess that's the best I can say about it, other than to say it's going to go higher and probably much higher. Stephen, earlier you were saying that silver could be $150 today just based on that ratio of 10 to 1. And that's not counting the industrial uses. Right. And the governments of the world tend to look at gold and silver as an indictment as they go up versus all fiat currencies globally. So they worry. They try to suppress those. Rather than worrying about the price of silver, if they let it go to $150 today, wouldn't it be better for cultivation of the metal? It would be. But it would also make solar energy very, very expensive. And silver, in you know, near $40, it's already 10% of solar energy cost. Silver at $80 would be 20%. So it does become more difficult, and there just is not that much silver. My guess is, Eric, I hate to say this, at a certain point, I'm not saying now, and this is not a prediction that's cast in stone, but I wouldn't be surprised if they banned public ownership of the metal itself. Not the mine. But the metal, just as during the Depression in the 30s, FDR banned the public ownership of gold. And during that time, gold miners like, I think, Homestake went up six, seven, eight fold during the Depression. I mean, they outperformed everything. So, I mean, you know, one bit of advice when it comes to silver and these precious metals is, yeah, I think it's okay to hold the bullion, but also make sure you have a couple of miners in your portfolio, too. Stephen, in closing here, can you let the listeners know about this book that you have coming out, Red Alert? Well, Red Alert is coming out September, October. Got a very nice review uh, on the Huffington Post just yesterday, so people can read that if they're curious about it. And uh, it's going to basically reiterate and go into much more detail on some of these issues that we've talked about here, Eric. Stephen Lieb, founder of the Lieb Group, president of Lieb Capital Management and editor of The Complete Investor. Thank you for joining us on King World News. Thank you so much, Eric, for having me. Be sure to tune in this week as we will continue to release interviews with the top people in the world throughout the week. Also, check out the King World News blog where this past few weeks we had interviews with Rob McEwen, John Williams, Hugo Salinas Price, Rick Santelli, Jim Sinclair, Robin Griffiths, Eric Sprott, Luis Yamada, Chris Whalen, Peter Schiff, James Turk, John Embry, Michael Pinto, Ben Davies, Dan Norsini, The London Source, as well as a few pieces from Richard Russell.